All right, all right. Hey, uh, so here's what I want to do this morning. You know, I don't know about you, but a lot of times uh, I take some time uh, at, at the week after Christmas, but up you know, through New Year's, and I like to use that time uh, to kind of reflect on the past year, uh, to think about the past year, or maybe even years, you know, gone by, uh, and also to kind of think about and plan and dream about uh, the future and what that looks like. I, I do that usually like personally uh, and in our family dynamic and I think about church stuff uh, and it's just a good kind of season uh, to do that. Of course, New Year, uh, a lot of times we have a lot of new b beginnings. People make a lot of New Year's resolutions. Some of you have already broken those New Year's resolutions. It's okay, I forgive you. Uh, you know, that's all right. You can start again tomorrow. Uh, uh, but the, these are the, the things that we can think to do in this season. It's kind of time to uh, analyze and to look forward and, and to look back. Uh, and one of the things I was doing this last week was I kind of looked back at the year we had as a church. And, and what was some of the things that God was teaching us and walking us through in, in this past year? Uh, and, and it was interesting because when I looked back and I looked at things that we covered, whether it was in main service uh, or in some of our men's stuff or in our women's stuff, when I looked back at the different things that we taught, it looks like something that was very carefully orchestrated and planned and outlined. But I'm here to tell you, I was not that strategic. <laughs> I did not have a plan at the beginning of last year. In fact, the only thing I knew last year was because of the year before, don't make plans, you have no clue what's gonna happen. But when I look back and I see the goodness of God and the steps that he leads us on and the faithfulness that he continues to bring us through as a church and then for me personally, I see his goodness, so I wanna take some time and I wanna just look at some of these really just highlights of, of what we talked about last year. Because we, we opened last year with a theme that I think is really important for this year as well, which is just like I said, it's really healthy and good to look backwards and to think about your past year, and it's really healthy and good to think about the upcoming year. But the thing that is healthy and the thing that is good can very quickly turn from good reflection to worry, concern, and anxiety, or regret. You can look back at the last year and as opposed to seeing God's faithfulness and to seeing the things that God helped you overcome, you can look back and think about the things that didn't happen, the things that, the, the experiences that fell through, the job opportunities that were lost, the hurts, and you can look back and be stuck in regret. Or you can be looking forward to this year and what starts off is like, I can't wait, new year, can very quickly become overwhelmed, anxious, worried, concerned. And though it's healthy, and it is healthy, and you should, to look back and reflect on God's goodness and to look forward and invite him into that process and where he should go, the moment that we either become fearful or anxious or full of regret is the moment that the enemy has tried to steal that seed. And so the thing that we get to do is we get to remember that we are called to live for today that Jesus calls us to live for today. In fact, one of the, like, we, we all know, if I were to say, hey, what's the shortest Bible verse in, in the Bible? My, all my kids know this. What's the shortest Bible verse in the Bible? Yeah, Jesus wept. Bible nerds. Uh, no. But the second shortest. What's the second shortest? Ha, ha, ha. One nerd rules them all. <laughs> Jesus said, Remember Lot's wife. Remember Lot's wife. Interesting. Now, there's a lot we could do this, and I won't go I extrapolate. You know the story of Lot and his wife. They were in Sodom and Gomorrah, and the angels came and took them out, and they were leaving, and they said, leave everything, go right now. And of course, they didn't go right now. And it's like, no, we really gotta go right now. And said, go, and no matter what you do, don't look back. Don't look back. Don't look back. Keep looking forward. Don't look back to the past, whether it was good or bad. Proverbs 3, 5 and 6 says, Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And he will make your paths 
straight. I love this because everyone knows that the, the quickest route to anywhere is a straight line. The straight line is the path that gets us where we go. But I don't know about you, sometimes I look where I'm at and where I'm going, and then I hear where God is calling me to, and it's like, God, I don't think you understand this straight line principle. I'm here, I wanna get to there, and you're asking me to go the whole different direction. Sounds like the nation of Israel, right? Like they were supposed to get, it should have been just a couple days journey through the wilderness. 40 years later, they hadn't quite gotten there. Sometimes it's like, why are we, what, what, God, I don't understand. You, you tell me you want to make my path straight, but it seems like I'm going the different route. But here's the thing. When you trust the Lord with all your heart, you can realize that God will get you where you need to go in the quickest route possible, but it probably won't look the way you think. I couple that with Proverbs 16, 9. In their hearts, humans plan their course but the Lord establishes their steps. You can make as many plans as you want. Listen, it's good, make plans, dream big, think about what you wanna do in business and in person and in grow, but the moment that you think that you will be the one responsible to get there is the moment that you will find yourself not getting there. We can make plans and we can invite the Holy Spirit into those plans, but sometimes the route that God takes us seems like it circumvents the directest path. But what you don't know is the direct path would not allow you to actually arrive at the destination. Straight is not always the fastest. Sometimes you have to go different routes, different paths, different ways. There's obstacles that you can avoid. There's hardships and hurts and wounds and traps that, and the path that God leads you on, you can do it. And what it requires of us is trusting. Trusting. And living for today. Matthew 6, 31 says, so don't worry about these things, saying what will I eat or drink or wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers, but your heavenly Father already knows all your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously and he will give you everything you need. So don't worry about tomorrow for tomorrow brings its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. If there is not a life principle to live on, today's trouble is enough for today. Do not borrow tomorrow's troubles. You cannot handle today's troubles let alone today's plus tomorrow's troubles. And what does Jesus say? My, my, he says that he gives you daily bread. That's something we don't understand because we live in the world of preservatives and I can go buy bread and it lasts like six weeks. Not six months, yeah, good Lord, don't eat that. <laughs> Maybe in Russia that's six months. Uh, just kidding, Yana, sorry, Happy New Year. Um, but they used, I mean, it was daily bread. Daily bread. The next day was not good bread. What was the manna from heaven? Daily bread. What happened if you tried to keep it? It's rotten. Today has enough trouble. Does he say there's no trouble today? No. It'd be nice. He says, today has enough trouble, but I got bread for today. And then guess what? You'll eat today's bread. You'll deal with today's trouble. I've overcome the world on your behalf. You will step out of today into tomorrow, and you will be met with new grace for tomorrow's trouble with tomorrow's bread. Because you may be looking at something that's a month away and thinking, there's no way I'm going to be able to overcome that thing. And there is no way until you have about 30 more days of daily bread. And in 30 more days of daily bread, what was impossible is possible. I can tell you in my wife and I's life, there's been so many times that I've been so stressed out about things that are on the horizon, that things were further away and thinking we're never gonna be able to do this. It doesn't add up. The numbers don't make it. This is not gonna happen. I can't do it. And my wife, who's really good at about living in daily bread, just kept saying, we'll get there, it'll, it'll come. And I'm like, you know, I don't think you understand how math works. 
Which is, yeah, I mean, to what she said, it may be true. Uh, but I said, listen, I don't think it's, it's, it's impossible. But lots of things are impossible for man. But nothing is impossible for God. The one who can bring dead things back to life has no problem fixing your credit score or making things work in your bank account or recovering things that you thought were lost and things that were stolen and bringing them back to you. That's the miracle working God who just says, just trust me daily. And I've got bread for today that overwhelms and overcomes the trouble that you'll meet today. So don't worry about tomorrow and don't regret yesterday. Live today. And as you take that step, you'll be on the straight path that I have for you. Straight path. The next thing we talked about last year was covenants. That God has made a covenant with you. And we actually looked at the four different covenants that we can see outlined in the Bible, but just for today's compressed uh, state. God has made a promise a contract, a covenant with you. And here's what's crazy. The contract, the covenant, the requirements, the terms, the only part that you do is you accept the sacrifice of Jesus. Jesus does all the rest of the fulfillment of the requirement and he overpays for every single thing. So you and I get to be recipients of God's righteousness, of God's grace, of God's mercy, of God's love, of his sonship, of his daughtership, as heirs and co-heirs and made priests and kings. Like this is the good news of the gospel, that he loved you so much that Jesus died so he could pay all of your debt of sin so that he could cover you and so that you and I could be in relationship with him. And here's what's even amazing about that. Not only did he make this covenant, as a result of this covenant, he gets to invite us into this journey. And, and we looked at this thing that as a, because of this covenant, and we saw this from the beginning, that, uh, that God took, takes things that are in chaos and he brings them to order. And as a result of the covenant he's made with you, there's things in your life right now that are chaotic and disordered and dysfunctional. And because he loves you so much, not only does he promise you eternity in heaven and unconditional love, he says in your life and your personal life, he wants to bring things that are chaotic and disordered into order and peace. That is who he is. From the very beginning, we, Genesis chapter one, verse one, it says in the beginning, God created the heavens, the sky, and the earth. And then it says in verse two, the earth was formless and void. The Hebrew there says it was wild waste, unordered and uninhabited. And the darkness was over the surface of the deep or the abyss. And the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. What did God do in the creation story? He took something that was disordered, that was out of order, that was uninhabitable, and that was in darkness, and he brought light, and he brought order, and he brought regiments, and he brought inhabitants, and he gave everything that was chaotic, and he brought it into peace. You see, his desire for you is to bring things out of chaos and into order. Maybe you have a few things in your life that just feel like no matter what you do, they spin out of control or a relationship that just is always something which is wild that you cannot handle or things with your kids or things in your health or things in your finances that feels like it's chaos. Because of the covenant we have with Jesus, we have the creator of the universe who says, I call things out of chaos and I bring them into order and peace through the provision of Jesus. Through the provision of Jesus. And here's what's wild. He's doing it today. He's bringing things out of chaos and he's putting it into order today. And not only is he willing to do it for you and to use that covenant for you, the amazing thing is he invites you and me to partner with him into reaching others 
and helping them know Jesus. So their chaos in their life can be transformed into order and peace. Because I am telling you, no amount of time on Facebook or Instagram or watching the news or going to Pilates or taking yoga or fasting or dieting or 30 something days to whatever, none of that will bring your life from chaos to order. But just a few moments in the presence of God will change your life forever. I told the story a few weeks ago of that amazing time when Jesus crossed the lake and the storm and he calmed the storm and then he went and saw the man and the man who was possessed with demons whose life was literally in chaos. With one word, he cast out those demons and the very next verse, the man whose everything about him was chaos. He was unclothed and chained and cut himself and like an animal, it says that he was in his right mind, seated at the feet of Jesus, fully clothed and in full peace. From chaos to order. Even thinking about the story, he went through the water. Water always represents chaos. Jesus went through the water and through the chaotic storm, and he calmed the storm so he could get to the other side and bring someone out of chaos into order. That's the God you serve. No matter how chaotic of a storm you may be facing right now, I am telling you with one word, Jesus can calm the storm and your life and bring you seated to his feet, fully clothed and in your right mind and in peace. And if he'd do it for you, he'll do it for others. He invites you to find that. In fact, that was Jesus' whole story. He told those parables that he would, that God would leave 99 to find one. Back to math that doesn't make sense. Because I'm like, what if you lose some of the 99? He'd leave 99 to find one because there's more rejoicing in heaven when one sinner finds out how loved they are and forgiven by God than for 99 righteous. And he invites you and I to be people who are looking for the one and saying, I see that your life is in darkness and chaos. I'm here as someone who's actually filled with the presence of God, who is made in the image of God, carrying the light of Christ with me into your darkness. And I, under the authority of Jesus Christ, am here to offer you peace. Be still. So that you can see how good God is. Because the ones matter to God. And we all have ones in our life. You have ones in your life that I will probably never meet, that I have no influence over. And your places of business, where you go to the grocery store, your family, your friends, we're called to participate in this journey. Then as a church, we went through what ended up being about, you know, 75% of our year. <clears throat> and we talked about that God wants to form you into a vessel of his presence. And we had two scriptures that I'm sure you have memorized at this point. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And then Mark 12, 30, it says, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these that we get to not be conformed by this world, that we can be, have our eyes open to what's going on around us, that we are in this world but not of this world, that we are citizens of heaven, that God is calling us to be formed into his image, that we are not just part of some kind of cultural Christian mu movement, but we are part of the resistance that is bringing the love of God to others, that we are no longer a cognitive majority, that we are part of the cognitive minority who believes that the love of God can conquer the power of darkness in our world. Not a political party, not a person, not a figure, not an army, not a country, but the person of Jesus Christ. 
And we are that person. We are that subversive movement. We are the people who carry something that's different, not in a way that argues people, but in a way in which the light of Jesus shines that looks different. We can live like Paul says, he says, live calm, peaceful lives. And you say, that sounds kind of, what does that do? Have you looked around? Who do you know that lives calm, peaceful lives? When was the last time you asked someone that you hadn't seen in a while and you said, hey, how's things going? They're like, it's just all calm and peaceful here. (laughs) I just actually have too much time. My kids are doing too well and I've got more money than I know what to do with and health is great. And even if that's true, that's not what people say. I'm busy, it's crayons, grind, work hard every day, no days off, hashtag winning. (laughs) We get to be carriers of this light that he wants to to form us. And then the very end, what we just most recently have done, we celebrated the first coming of Jesus and the presence of hope, peace, love, and joy. And the idea of Romans 15, 13, where it says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all of this, all of these things come under what we feel like our mission as a church is, which is to know Jesus and to show Jesus. That's what we exist for. That's why we are here. That's why we are part of this community of believers. That I, as the pastor, and my hope for you, and our staff's hope for you, is that you intimately and personally know Jesus. I don't mean know about Jesus. Our city is full of a lot of people who know about Jesus. Ask anybody anywhere in Tulsa or Broken Arrow, and everyone knows a little bit about Jesus, and everyone will tell you what their home church is, even if they haven't been there in 15 years, because that's the answer that makes sure you don't invite them to another church. I go to restaurants and ask people what church they go to, and they still say they go to Destiny, and Eastman is really great. (laughs) And you know, when it used to happen to Pastor Mike, it was at least like semi, like semi close, you know, like only seven years or something. At this point, it's like, it's been decades. I want you to know Jesus, not the facts, though the facts help. I want you to personally know the one who's transformative, the type of man who could look at someone and tell them to follow me and they would drop their entire life to follow him. The type of person that it says that he went around healing all, not because that was his mission, but because he was moved to so much compassion that he could not help but to be moved to people's hardships. The picture where it says that they used to line the sick and infirmed along the streets and that Jesus would walk with his hands outstretched touching them and everything in front of Jesus was sickness and death and decay, but everything behind Jesus was life and healing. That is the person that I want you to know because he will change your life. You will not be the same when you encounter Jesus. The things that are strongholds in your life, the sin that holds you back, the addiction that you cannot break, the wounds that you carry from your past, he will walk with you on a journey to bring transformative change in your life. And some of those things will be instantaneous, and some of those things will be a process that you walk through slowly, probably with others in the journey to find full and complete healing. But Jesus will guide you with the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can be transformed. And I I know that when you know Jesus, the result, because it is you cannot help it, is you show Jesus. You are transformed so much that you can't help but show. You cannot help but look different, but to sound different, to, to live different, to speak different. And you know, this all comes from Jesus is teaching one of the last commandments he gave in Matthew 28. 
He says, it says, then the 11 disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some of them doubted. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you and be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This commandment that he gives to, to us that we get to walk and we, we figure out what this means for us is he says, make disciples. Have people make the decision to accept Jesus and say, I want to live the way that Jesus lived. I want to apprentice under him. I want my life to look like him. And he says, and this one, what does it take for that to happen? He says, baptizing them. Now, I believe he was talking about physical, the process of being baptized. I think that's a powerful physical act. But we're going from chaos to order through the water. Make them be disciples, baptize them through the water so that what was chaotic in their life is brought into order. And he says, teach them, teach the new disciples to obey the commands, not the law, the commands that Jesus gave. Love God, love others with everything that you have. In this, all the law and all the prophets is fulfilled. And be sure of this, I'm with you. That isn't a blind encouragement. That is a factual truth. He is with you always even to the end of the age. And the way we take this command of Jesus that was birthed, the birthplace of the church, is to say, the way I can make disciples is I want people to know Jesus. The way I become a better disciple or I grow in my discipleship to Jesus is to know him more and to be transformed more and more to look like him, to sound like him, to live like him, to talk like him. And the way I do that is the more time I spend in his presence, the more time that I get to watch and see him through scripture and the more time I get to experience others who have been walking and growing in their discipleship or their apprenticeship to Jesus, I get to be encouraged and I know Jesus better. And then I get to show Jesus to people. I get to help make disciples. That starts with my children. That I get to show them what it means to be a follower of Jesus. I get to show them that not only through scripture, uh, not only through my really exemplary behavior, but I also get to show that to them when I fail and I fall short and I ask for forgiveness. Because I'm not only called to follow Jesus, I'm called to be part of others' journey in following Jesus. I get to help people bring their lives from chaos to order through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I get to remind people and remind myself that Jesus and his presence and the Holy Spirit are with me always. Which means everywhere that I walk, Everywhere that I go is holy ground. Not because of me, but because of the spirit of God that's in me. So when you go to your workplace, if you work at Chick-fil-A, it's already holy ground. You don't need to do anything about it. But if you work anywhere else, you bring the presence of God and it just became holy. Now it may go right back to Sodom and Gomorrah the second you leave. But you transform places. Jesus was not on a rescue mission. Jesus was on an invasion of his love and presence and goodness. To take back what was taken and was rightfully his father. 
And I say all that. And I look back and say, those are the things we learned together as a church last year. And if you want to know what we're going to be learning and walking through together this upcoming year, I'm just telling you it's going to be the same thing. We are going to learn how to grow in our discipleship and our apprentice to Jesus. We are going to learn how to look into our community and to reach out and to make new disciples. We're going to learn how to make disciples within our family. We are going to learn how to bring things out of chaos and into order through the partnership of the Holy Spirit. We are going to look at understanding what does it mean to know that the presence of God is with me always. We're going to walk and learn and grow in how to know Jesus better. And how as a result of that, we can show him more. And starting next week, we're actually going to take some time and we're going to be unpacking for you in this new year how we are going to be accomplishing that and in what level we're going to be accomplishing that in each one of our three children's departments. How are we doing that in kids that are zero to five years old? How are they knowing Jesus and showing Jesus? What are we teaching them? Because it is not child care that we are doing over there in those classes. They are hearing about the very transformative power of Jesus Christ. How are we doing that in first through fifth grade? How are we doing that in youth age? What does it look like? How do we in the age appropriate place and in the right time be able to show them this love of Jesus and help them know Jesus and show Jesus where they're at? Because I can tell you this, a lot of discipleship, the first place it starts is with me, the second place it starts is my family. And then it can expand out from there. Sometimes people get so excited about helping someone else and some stranger over here, or some, they forget about their own ministry. We get to walk in that together. And so for the next the rest of this month, that's what we're gonna be talking about. What does it look like? And I'm telling you, it's gonna encourage you. If you have kids, you're gonna be encouraged. If you got grandkids, you're gonna be encouraged. If you don't have kids, you're gonna be looking for people with kids and telling them you need to get your kids over here because you are gonna see a result of kids not just being taken care of and having fun and all of those great things, but experiencing something. And if you have no kids or you're not at that age or you're too old, to, I'm telling you, the message will mean something to you because the power of knowing Jesus transforms lives no matter how old you are. And the journey that we're bringing these kids on, whether you knew it or not, is the same journey that you've either gone through or maybe are in the process of going through. Some of you may find out, oh, I'm actually in the third grade uh, stage of my walk with Jesus. And that's okay. I was stuck in junior high for a really long time. My humor is still there. Uh, no. <clears throat> but that's what we get to do, church. And I can tell you I'm so excited. I'm so excited for this upcoming year. And I, I know very little specifics of what's going to happen for sure. But I am totally confident that the same God who walked us through 2021 and 2022, that same God will walk us through 2023. And we can make plans, but he'll direct our steps. And we'll get to see the goodness of God here in the land of the living and be part of the kingdom of God together. And I am looking forward to it more than words can express to walk through the season with you. And I want to do this as we close. Just, it's not our usual closing, but because it's the first, I think it's important. I just want to invite you to stand up where you're at. Uh, and if you're comfortable, uh, join hands with someone close to you. If you're not comfortable, do it anyways. Um,
before I just want to pray. I just want to pray. I want to dedicate this year for our church and for you and your family that we can see him in this moment. Father God, I thank you so much for today. Lord, I thank you for your faithfulness in seasons past. Lord, I thank you for the dreams that you, and the encouragement and the visions that you're sharing with us for our future. But most of all, Father God, I thank you for today. For today's portion for being part of this church today and the calling that you have given us. Lord, we dedicate this upcoming year to you. Lord, in every service, in every gathering, in every moment, have your way. Lead our steps. Lord, because we desire those who are far from you to be drawn close. We desire for the ones in our lives who don't know who you are to know you. We desire for our walk with you and our apprenticeship to you to draw closer. And for our family and for our children to know you more. So Lord, in this year and in this time, have your way. When things are great, help us remember you. When things are hard, help us press into you. Thank you that you're the God of more than enough. That every moment we step into a new day, your grace is sufficient. The daily bread is there to greet us. Thank you that you're promised that even though in this world there'll be troubles, that there'll be wars and rumors of wars, and chaos and confusion that the world brings, that we are in this world but not of this world, that we are citizens of heaven, and that you've overcome the world. Speak to our hearts, Father. Give us the nudgings on things this year that we can walk through and grow in and trust you in more so that we can come to look more like you, Father. It's in your holy name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, hey, church, listen, I love you so much. I'm looking forward to this year. Don't forget, one service next Sunday. Going to be awesome. You are dismissed. Have a great rest of your Sunday. <laughs>